Hey, Canon, would you mind getting the door? Thank you. Okay. All right, welcome everyone to this discussion of atmospheres of violence with the author Eric A. Stanley and Formaline. Thank you for coming in on this bright and sunny day when you could be outside enjoying the beautiful spring weather. <laughs> But you came here, which I really appreciate. Um, so welcome to the Bureau of General Services Queer Division. My name is Greg Newton. I am the co-founder, along with my partner, Donnie Jokum, of the Bureau. And the short explanation for our long name is that we are a government agency for a government that does not yet exist. And this is the service we provide. It's just holding this space for queer books and queer culture. Uh, so we're happy to have you today. We are an all-volunteer organization. Canon Reckling is volunteering on alternate Sunday shifts. Um, and volunteers, donations, and sales are what keep this boat afloat. Um, so we do have a suggested donation of $10. I'm going to pass around a bag, and there's change in here. If you're able to give something, whatever you're able to give, we appreciate. And if you're not, that's fine, too. And if you'd rather buy a book than make a donation, that is a wonderful way to support us as well. So I'll pass that around. Um, Venmo is also an option. You can Venmo us at BGSQD, which are the letters all around you, to your left, right. Um, you can't miss it. Um, so I'm going to, oh wait, sorry. I love part of my script. <laughs> I'm just gonna read a brief land acknowledgement, and then we're gonna jump right in and get started. So the Bureau acknowledges that our organization operates on the unceded land of the Munsi Lenape. We are actively seeking to partner with and provide material support to a local queer indigenous organization. And we hope to make an announcement about this partnership in the near future. But in the meantime, we encourage you to join the Bureau in signing up to make a monthly donation to the American Indian Community House's Manhattan Fund. Yes, you're donating to us and then we're donating to them. It's kind of how, how things work. <laughs> we pass it around. Um, the Manhattan Fund, according to its website, is an invitation to all settlers and non-Native people who wish to acknowledge the legacy of theft and genocide that comprise the history of New York City and the United States. And you can find out more at manhattanfund.org. So please give a warm welcome to Eric A. Stanley and Formally. Hi everybody, how's it going? Can you can hear me okay? Yeah, yes. I'm a mumbler and a speed talker, so I'll let me know if either of those things need to be adjusted. Um, do whatever you need to do in the space, make your body feel as good as it can. Um, so first, I want to thank Formally. So to, we were talking about this and we were trying to decide like how long ago we met and how long we've been friends. And it's like creeping up on 20 years now. Um, and Tourmaline's work, we uh, read this book and we um, co-edited a book back there called Trap Door. And then Tourmaline was really central to another book that I helped work on called Captive Gender, which is also back there. So we've been on this artistic, which is to say literary, which is to say world building, which is to say world destroying journey together for a long time. Um, and in this particular text, um, you know, I engage with so much of your um, filmic work and also your writerly work, right? Um, you know, it's easy to be free, it's easy to be alive. Your words, um, which I end the book with, um, were in a certain sense, like the most challenging words I had to sit with. And so I want to thank you for that, all of us. Um, yeah, it's really an honor to be in conversation with you. Uh, you have, you know, close to 20 years, um, maybe like 15 years ago, we were organizing the, uh, what was it, critical resistance, um, gathering 2008. I can't do math. So <laughs> whatever amount of time that was. And before that, we were working for, for years together. The um, 
transforming justice uh, convening in 2007 was this gathering in the Bay that, um, you know, that Miss Major and us and many of the like, um, I don't know, the ways that we orient around trans life and queer life um, and abolition really um, was seated in those moments. And so I really appreciate how you tended to this like lush abundance that has been ongoing and unfolding for, for quite a while. Um, so I'm thinking today, um, maybe we'll just like chat some. I'm probably actually not going to read anything. Maybe I'll read something later on, just a little bit of it, but we'll see. So we'll kind of just chat and then we'll open it up to all of you all to keep it kind of casual and in the um, general ethos of attempting to, again, build the world and destroy them. <laughs> and so, yeah, that's okay with me. Yeah, I have like 10 questions that I, I there's like five that I really want to ask right, you about yeah. the book. Um, but uh, I thought maybe I like before we do a quick chat, yeah. like just ask you like this book has been a culmination point of a 15 year project for you. Um, and I'm really curious like what set you down the path of writing this book? Um, I think actually what started it, um, I read on a bathroom wall, what if it feels good to kill and mutilate poems? And I had to sit with that question for a long time because of its insistence on pleasure and violence and the coterminous relationship between those two things, how they live and die together, um, which, you know, the collective we and the collective we in this room have always known that, you know, the ongoingness of settler colonialism, the ongoingness of chattel slavery, the ongoingness of racial capitalism are structuring events, meaning they're not structural, they don't exist somewhere, they're ongoing. Um, so we had that kind of shared analysis, but but that, you know, graffiti um, forced me to confront um, again the kind of question of pleasure um, as it express itself in anti-trans and anti-queer violence. And so for me, I think it took so long to actually like make this book happen because this is a conversation that we've been in for a long time. Like, what does it mean to represent violence, even if it's in word? And what does it mean to look away from violence, right? In both instances, we're still in the scene of harm. Right? There's no outside. And so how do we do this work? How do we build what I call this wicked archive, this brutal archive, while also knowing that at the same time, artists, organizers, right, people that are inhabiting all these different spaces at once are simultaneously building trapdoors, escape hatches, and other ways of living, right? So how do you hold both of those things? And one of the things that, was you know, why I think in particular your words at the end were so powerful to me because there is this, and I talk about this a lot, but there's, you know, in a lot of these kinds of books, it'll be like four chapters, it'll be like bad, 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 art, good, right? Or like bad, 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 organizing and you're free, right? And people do that because it's a linguistic trick to make your reader feel good, right? And it also, as a writer, it makes you feel good because you like solve the mystery at the end of the episode. And so, you know, what would it mean to both have a solution and a non-solution? What would it mean to hold both of those at once? And so I think that that's why it took so long. And, you know, it was a journey and it was revision. It was also all the organizing that we and lots of people in this room were doing is the precondition of this book. And that precondition is ongoing. You know, and so it's like kind of a, a chronicle of my life you know, in an interesting way when I look at it now I'm like oh right because you know we were there and we did that thing and then we tried this other thing and that didn't work and we made this other mistake and we just kept trying yeah what and I think like when you talk about this is one of the questions when you talk about like keep trying and make that mistake like what role does um like failing at the project have for the book and for your for your life um I mean, I think that the enormity of these structuring systems is so big that we have to like match them with 
you know, our collective care for ourselves, right? Um, and all we have ever been told is that we're not gonna get free. So it's gonna be really hard to imagine what freedom could even feel like, right? And so of course we're gonna fail, of course we're all, you know, it's not as if we were produced by these systems and then we like became someone else, right? We're reproduced by these systems every day, all day. It's all we have actually. Um, and so, you know, the failure then um, is an invitation for us to reorganize what constitutes like success and failure, I think, right? Like the, the thing that we were organizing for might not have worked. I actually, my joke, which is, you know, the, the hard truth is I've never been involved in a campaign that's won. Like my whole life, you know, it's like, it's true. Um, uh, you know, so how do we reorganize scales so that our friendship mm -hmm. is the win, mm -hmm. right? Our collective being here today is the win versus, you know, whatever thing. And it's not to say that we let go of the whatever thing, but we have to like, as Major says at the end, we have to figure out how to keep going on, right? Mm -hmm. We have to find our like personal, which is always to say collective ways of inhabiting the dreadful beauty of this decaying world so that we can try to create something else together. I think that's a really beautiful point. Like I've been in, um, I used to be a campaign organizer and I was doing that when, when we met. Um, one of the first campaigns I worked on was in the early 2000s and it was, um, it was in 2005 uh, through seven and it was about stopping um, New York City from building a new jail in the South Bronx. And that was like actually a successful campaign. And then um, there was like one around New York State refused to allow trans and gender informed people to have health care under Medicaid. Mm -hmm. And there was a big campaign that a lot of us did to repeal that regulation. Um, and while like some of those have been successful, it's, I think it's really important what you're offering is um, like whether something successful in the eyes of the state or the eyes of the media doesn't get to determine how we feel about we, right? Like we can feel our friendship or we can feel like the power of coming together in the midst of a mess of a thing, regardless of um, whether something is like marked as like a clear win or not. And so I think that is something that you're foregrounding and offering and continuing to offer in a really, a really powerful way. Yeah, you said better than me as you. I wonder, I have another question. Yeah, okay. Okay. Like, throughout the book, you really do work to couple like um, just like a lot of detail about atmospheric violence. And so I'm curious like if you could tell us all what that means to you. Uh, and then I have a couple of follow-up questions. Yeah, so the title, um, it uh, comes from a line from Fonce Fanon. Um, and atmospheric seemed useful here because again, I was trying to, to write nearby or pay attention to forms of violence that were everywhere or nowhere, right? And that's actually the kind of structuring affect and affects are always material that I was trying to at least capture for long enough to put it on a page. And it felt like by the time you do that, it's already escaped. Um, and so atmospheric then became one way to kind of chart that, right? Like it's, right? Because the, the atmosphere in both in terms of the way that Phenom is talking about it and kind of popular, um, popular understanding um, is also that which enables life and that which can destroy life. And so it's also that coupling that felt really important because the book is deeply invested in ending the forms of harm that are taking so many of our lives. So that's it's, you know, that's, that's what it's interested in. But it also is equally invested in pushing against a kind of pacifist um, and anti-violence narrative that believes that um, you know, non-response is gonna get us free, right? For Fanon, it's, it's revolutionary violence that is the only um, way that the kind of coming post-colonial future can unfold. And so, you know, he's um, one of the primary people that I think through in this book, which is, you know, strange for some people, but for me, he's so 
um, delicately and forcefully describes the condition of unlivability that for him was a really different time and place, but there's you know intense echoes that are still forming the limits of the world that we're inhabiting. Absolutely. Uh, at another moment, you talked about how Fanon and Marsha P. Johnson are two of the like primary theorists that you are frequently in conversation with. I wonder if you could share a line about that. Yeah. So um, a line that I always credit to you because you gave it to us was, you know, theory is people attempting to describe their lives. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's so beautiful and so useful, right? Um, because it's true, everyone's a theorist. So what constitutes theory and not theory, like that's not useful. So it's just mm -hmm. people trying, you know. So I think about that definition along with like someone like Ruthie Gilmore's definition of like theory as a plan to action. Um, so you know, thinking about those resonances, um, it was really important to me um, to not to attempt as well as I could to never um produce people as examples, right? That happens in a lot of work. It's like, oh, we're gonna have the theoretical apparatus here and then we're gonna place it upon mm -hmm. the fleshiness of someone's um, life, body, worlds, language, whatever it is. And so what I was seeing when I um, started reading a lot of Marsha's writing, which you excavated for us all a long time ago, um, was that she was also theorizing um, structuring violence in ways that um, was really interesting to place in kind of productive tension against them, right? And so, um, you know, she's a theorist. Um, Tourmaline's a theorist that I think with a lot. Ashley Diamond, who is another amazing filmmaker and theorist, is someone that I think with a lot, um, along with like people that are more recognizable. Um, you know, that, that felt politically um, urgent to me to show that um, we're all, as you say, making theory all the time. And it's there. And, you know, our job, one of our jobs as writers is like, how are we going to pay close attention to it? And so that's why, that's why those two figures in particular kind of emerge. Um, another figure that you write about, and I know we've like just like, um, you know, back in 2009 was Duana Johnson, who was a black trans woman living in Memphis, and she figures in the book. And um, I remember like after we were organizing around her resistance, the massive convening in 2008, and really trying to lift up and foreground like trans life as inextricably linked from um, abolition her case got a lot more attention. And so I'm wondering if you can talk about Duana Johnson and why, um, you know, Duana Johnson's life uh, like so deeply resonated with many of us. First, I'll say that um, the very idea that trans and queer, this life, politics, whatever you want to call it, has anything to do with imprisonment has been a long and ongoing battle <laughs> like we, we formed our closeness of our friendship and um, a kind of deep affinity with understanding that because of the world that we lived in and our own experiences while having you know having a lot of pushback my diplomatic way um go on um right and so we like you know literally we were like working on captive genders, we were like doing, having these conversations, we were organizing and attending Transforming Justice, um, working with TGI, Transgender, Gender Variant and Intersex Justice Project, sorry, I'm trying not to speak in acronyms. Um, so, you know, that was the kind of, the, you know, the materiality of the organizing work that we and many other people were trying to play. And um, Dwana Johnson, um, she was attacked by a Memphis police officer really brutally. Um, you can actually watch the tape online um and then after that so she survived that initial beating while she was you know handcuffed it was really brutal and she went on a media tour where she wanted people to see the tape she wanted to like get word out about she had a support case against the Memphis police department um and of course um you know 
the officer, it went to trial and the officer, they, it was a hung jury and it was a, not, you know, so then it went back and then he pled, but what he actually pled for was tax evasion, right? And so what that did was illustrate um, the reality that we all know, especially, you know, those of us that work in producing visual culture, but the question that it opened up was, how can you both see and not see something simultaneously, right? The force of anti-Blackness in the form of the visual itself, right? So not just the image, but the form was so powerful that the jury, which was not all white, could not see her being attacked, right? And lots of people thought about this in relationship to Rodney King and lots of lynching photography. There's a lot of, of, of work on this. So I draw on those kinds of genealogies. And then, um, you know, one of the questions that I'm left with, that we're all left with, those of us that go on, is what does it mean, comma, how can we do justice to Dewana Johnson, right? Because she was subsequently murdered after this. Um, speculation that it was by a police officer because of the way that she was murdered, we don't know. So she wasn't available to give a survivor's testimony in the trial, right? Um, and, you know, how can I like hold on to that question with all of you all without assuming that there's an answer to it? How can I do that? And then also, you know, there's a way that we could assume because she was emphatic that she wanted everyone to see this tape, that looking at it is somehow like more okay or something like that. Um, right, but again, both looking at it and not seeing it, we're still tied to that scene. And so how to write about really horrific incidences without showing pictures, without being too graphic, but also while paying close enough attention so it doesn't fall into like a general generality, right? Where everything is substitutional and everything's like that and like that and like that. Because one of the arguments that I make is there's something about the specificity, the intimacy, the pageantry of anti-trans and queer violence that feels like we must pay attention to. It can just become like generalizable violence because that's actually what the state wants, right? It wants it indistinguishable from any other kind of violence. That's how it uh, sissifies, sissifies her, <laughs> like the bad one, not the good one, um, you know, and heterosexualized, heterosexualizes it in white washes. Um, yeah, and so Joanna Johnson, you know, her words, um, the testimony that she gave, the preliminary testimony, she was murdered, um, the, any interviews that she did. Um, are so incredibly powerful because she's demanding something she wants us to know. But again, we're still caught in that scene. So. Um, I think that that's so powerful because you're also working with, um, so you're simultaneously working with a specific kind of aesthetics of violence that we're both seeing and not seeing, but you're frequently working to, to link that to a visual culture that nourishes. So you're simultaneously doing both. And I wonder why you do that. Why are you offering that stuff? So, um, you know, something that um, we said a lot in Trap Door that we worked on together is that, you know, visual culture is that which brings us into the world, but also that which can take us out of the world. Right? Um, and so it's so powerful, but how its power shows up, I think, needs much more excavation. Right? And that's a project that you've been helping us understand, and many people in this room have been helping us understand, like how it actually shows up. Um, and you know, again, visual culture—if it's building the world, then it is also among, not the only, but among our avenues for pleasure and for joy and for identification and for this I mean, for all those things. And so, it's so important. And so, again, figuring out how it unfolds feels so urgent because you know and one of the things that we said in trapdoor and something that i echo in this book is that you know whatever the state is most readily going to give us is the thing that we need the least stuff um and that's usually positive representation right in the current era that we're in so you know what would it mean and this is a long project that many people including you have been deeply involved in what would it mean to foreground, um, 
you know, a trans politic that is deeply disruptive and joyful and pleasurable and uncanny and all those things, right? And so, you know, I look to your work and to a bunch of other people in the book as offering us, you know, at least a preliminary map out of the hellscape that we're currently living in. Um, and, you know, that's one of the reasons that, um, you know, I continually return to your work. I'm like, bring this whole book just about your work. Um, you know, check it all out. Um, yeah, and so, you know, a lot of that work, I was writing this book when we were doing Capdoran, so there's like this kind of reverberation between the two, you know, just thinking more and more deeply, settling in deeper into um, the reality that I, I don't actually know. You know, I have a whole bunch of questions, but I'm not actually sure what's happening. Um, and I think there's something, you know, there's a kind of sorcery around the visual um, that mandates us mandates a kind of production of that mm -hmm. yeah. I, I have a few more questions but you know so when I got the book I immediately went to the Hudson River where the image from the cover is and um, but, you know I was looking at it staring at it and so much life uh, has flowed around the Hudson River Christopher Street which used to be an estuary um, it's like one of the longest streets in, in Manhattan and used to be like living water. Um, so much life has flowed through that location. I'm curious how you came upon the, the cover image as someone who's an artist and uh, aesthetics means so much to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this image is by um, Every Ocean Views who has an exhibit up at the Whitney right now and it's in deep conversation with Alvin Beltrop's work and I think we're both back there. Show. Um, so, you know, there's been a kind of long genealogy of artists, which is to say all kinds of people um, chronicling both their lives and the collective life that was built on along the water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we know the kind of, um, you know, we know lots of stories. We might have lived that ourselves, we might continue to live that ourselves. And this image in particular, for me, so I knew I didn't want like pictures of people or something like that, right? Um, and there's, you know, we went, we went through some covers to look at there. Um, and because it felt really important to me, like, you know, if one of my, one of the things that I offer is the kind of problematic nature and possibility of representation itself and what does it mean to have a representation on the front of it? So I painted myself in a corner. Um, but this, <laughs> this, this, this picture in particular, um, I think captures the like haunting beauty of the water's edge, all the liveliness that mm -hmm. is thrown from there, all the cruising, all the worlds that were built, all the breakups, all the love, mm -hmm. all the all of that, while also feeling incredibly like ghosted mm -hmm. in a way. Right. I mean, it kind of, it looks a little bit, you know, there's like a kind of cemetery feel to it, right? Mm -hmm. And then we think about the hyper gentrification that has literally bulldozed over mm -hmm. the entire shore, mm -hmm. right? And at the same time, erected monuments to its successful you know, destruction. Mm -hmm. um, like photos like this, and well, not this photo, but photos like this in the lobby of the new condo, you know, like that phenomenon. Um, and so, you know, I, again, I was hoping that it could at least momentarily um, speak towards some of the concerns. I think it's, I mean, the picture just to me feels like incredibly, yeah, incredibly haunted and also beautiful. It's so full of life and life's rendition. Mm -hmm. One of the, um, like, album Fall Trap, one of the last moments, uh, um, Marsha walking around and being um, filmed for this documentary that never came out was her like screaming ow, you know, mm -hmm. like um, from across the way mm -hmm. at Pride in, in 1992, and that makes me think a lot about the cover of this photo, yeah. um, and and Marcia. and um, I, I'm curious, like, what's that? One of the ways that we talk about like reading the book is uh, with a lot of care for yourself, like going slow with it, mm -hmm. while simultaneously like 
it being so urgent. So I'm curious, like how you uh, balance those two. Like, yeah, I mean, so if people haven't read it yet, um, it's intense. There's a lot in here, and you know, I do have a whole like generally saying there's a section called reading with care where I encourage people to read it slowly, read it with people, um, read it in little little pieces, you know, however that might show up for you. Um, you know, and I hope that people have the capacity to do that or just like leave it a little bit too much. Um, because one of the things obviously I didn't want to do is re-traumatize people that were already traumatized. Like that's not, not what I'm trying to do here. Um, but I am trying to create enough of an opening so that we can be with, like, what does it mean to be with catastrophic ending? Mm -hmm. and just to be with it, to not incorporate it into ourselves, to not refuse it as best we can, to stay in that space of deep ambivalence, um, you know, to witness, you know, you might, other people might call it witnessing or something like that. Um, in a kind of non-incorporative or non-incorporative um, manner. Um, you know, and I think that that was also one of the reasons why it took me so long to write this book, because I rewrote it so many times, you know, that I was really deeply invested in, uh, at the level of the sentence, how can I create both an invitation, a space of respite, and a space of disruption all within a sentence. And, you know, I fail all the time. I'm like, that. but you know, those are the things I was thinking about. Like, how can I do all those things so that it can feel like affirming? Mm -hmm. Like, I think there's something about this book when you like are experiencing this and you're like, yeah, all that fucking shit happened to me, you know? So it's like, uh, and I think that's actually really important. I think that we like push that away too much. Yeah. Um, so, you know, a kind of affirmation, a kind of spell, you know, a landing space, um, and a call to action. I mean, you know, it's like, that is as important to me, like um, you know, both quieting and disruptive at the same time. Um, and so it took a long time because I kept returning to the sentence and it was also just like a hard thing to do because I'm it's not as if this archive exists somewhere. I'm like building it and cutting out things in magazines. So there. Um, cutting out things in magazines and collecting them and sitting with them and having to research them and talk with survivors and family, you know, family members, however that's defined, et cetera. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I really wanted, I wanted to allow myself to be haunted by the question, you know, what does it mean to do, to do, to do justice? To that up in the longer term. Um, yeah. I think that's so powerful also because, you know, how we open about talking about like, um, it's like failure and success. And um, what does it mean to do justice uh, is a similar way, of, you know, um, I think like assessing success or failure and also um, really like what you're offering simultaneously is like um, showing up in a state of like connection and togetherness in the midst of a mess of a thing is answering that question beyond what um, someone, I, someone else might say is like success or failure. Uh, I think that's like a really powerful invitation at the level of a sentence too. I remember like Kayi Lumumbabaro was uh, an organizer with us at Turtle for Resistance, you know, uh, like 20 years ago. And um, she was talking about like the power of burping and the sentence structure, right? So like um, really encouraging us to, you know, like not only say the police are killing us, right? but also put ourselves as the subject of our own sentences and subjects to birth. Mm -hmm. Like we are doing this, mm -hmm. you know, we are doing that. We are showing up, we are showing out, we are having care, we are having ease. Uh, we are grieving, we are mourning, we are gathering on the river all the time or not. And so to me, I think what you're doing too is like, um, yeah, just like at the level of sentence, reflecting that. And also like that duality um, of like, both being the object and finding like the importance in that and also being the subject of her. You can write the rest of it. <laughs> you can write volume books and associate. <laughs> I mean, I think that whenever I'm talking to you in conversation with you, 
I'm reaffirmed of the depths of our cancerous connection mm -hmm. and how so much of the way that I think about the possibility of the world is because, again, of the doors that opened up and pulled for all of us. Like we're all doing it together, yeah. like simultaneously. I wonder if it's a good moment to like open up yeah. the conversation and if other people have questions or uh, thoughts. Yeah. So quiet. I know. It's, really, it's a really important aspect as well. So. Yeah. Well, if not, I just want to say thank you. I think sometimes like small group questions and small moments of like reflection are also really powerful. Yeah. So maybe this is a good moment to like pause yeah. and, and have that. Yeah, thank you so much and feel free to, yeah, I know speaking in front of people is not everyone's thing. So <laughs> I know that. Um, so feel free to come to chat and yeah. um, buying books here is a great way to support the space. There's not, as we know, the very possibility of something like a bookstore is always shrinking. And so it's important to support that. And again, I want to thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks for everyone. Thanks, everybody.